Good afternoon and welcome to UB's fifth annual three minute thesis competition. My name is Graham Hamill and I'm Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Graduate School. It's my pleasure at this time to welcome President Satish Tripathi to offer some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Graham. Thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate uh, everyone being here. Uh, uh, this is uh, a great day. Uh, we are really uh, uh, very, very happy to, to see you all. It's a nice day here, as I said. And uh, I'm really delighted that you could join us for UB's annual three-minute thesis competition. I, I have attended a few of those, and uh, I always look forward to uh, seeing what's going on in our research field, our PhD students. Uh, it's always uh, good to learn about uh, your, your thesis, your work, and uh, it's, it's also good to really see that how you can present your work in three minutes. You know, I, you know it's, it's, it's really uh, important. These are the elevator talks. It's very important to think about how you tell somebody what you're doing. We can always talk for an hour about our thesis. I remember uh, you know, many, many, many years ago, uh, this, this was really uh, something that uh, we didn't have, but it, when I wanted to talk about my thesis, it took a long time. And it's still people did not understand what I was talking about. So, so really, uh, I, I, as I said, I've attended some of these and I've found this very, very uh, enlightening. And uh, this is, uh, as I said before, it's almost like mission impossible. How do you do this in three years? Yet as a scholars, we have a responsibility to explain our research to public. And after all, that's what we are. That's what we serve. We serve the public. Our core mission really is to do good for the public. As today's uh, presentations will uh, reveal, this is how we demonstrate UB's relevance and impact. To all of today's participants, I'm inspired by your commitment to solve complex societal issues. And I'm eager to see how you are using new ways of thinking and creating approaches for the betterment of our world. I would also like to thank and welcome our judges back to UB, virtually speaking. I know you are all over the world. This year's competition is particularly exciting because of uh, the fact that all of our judges are both UB alumni, as well as past winners of the competition. They understand what it is like to be where you are and what it takes to get to this point in such a rigorous competition. And I know they join me in congratulating all of our finalists for your commitment to excellence and innovation. In this competition's spirit of brevity, I believe my three minutes are up. So again, thank you for joining us and best of luck to our finalists. Thank you, Dr. Tripathi and welcome all of you. I'd like to especially welcome the, the families, friends, colleagues, advisors that are in the audience today. My name is Alan Belicha. I'm a director of business development at the University of Buffalo, working in the economic development unit, business and entrepreneur partnerships. I, like you, once was a, a PhD student. And I remember very well when my mother asked me about what, what are you doing? And I told her the title of my dissertation and she almost fell asleep immediately. And it became really a, an illuminating moment for me to try to figure out, well, how, how do I communicate this with, with other people? And it is of fundamental importance, as we have seen this past year, that we are all educated, that we all understand how things function, and that we do our share of the work trying to educate those around us. And all of you um, graduating uh, students, you're going to play such an important role in educating your friends, colleagues, family members as you move on into your professional careers. So I am, I am privileged and thrilled to be here and to be the MC for this event. I have had the, the fortune of being a, a judge in prior years, and I have enjoyed very much. I have always learned something from all of these short presentations, and I'm definitely looking forward to, to learning more today. So today for the audience, again, the PhD students are going to be presenting their research. They're going to be judged on their communication style in two ways. First, we need to understand the research, 
that is communicated in a language that is appropriate for just about everyone in this audience. And second, we're very interested in, in learning from that one slide, how that slide is gonna transmit that message and enhance the presentation of the, of the individual. The presentation is also going to be judged in the comprehension and will, will the audience understand the research? And please know that the audience today is a judge as well. You will have the opportunity to participate in some voting, I will warn you in, when that comes about. And you will be able to cast a vote to select a winner as well, the People's Choice Award. Finally, the presenters are going to be judged on how engaging they are. Are they excited about what they're communicating? We are today very honored to have a esteemed panel of judges, as Dr. Tripathi mentioned. Some of them are actually coming from very far away and they're, they're participating in this event at one in the morning, I just learned. So thank you for that. More, more interestingly, the, the judges include first, second and third place winners of the three minute thesis. And they are made up, as Dr. Tripathi mentioned as well, of UB alumni. They are currently working in a, in a number of different roles. And I think that that exemplifies the success of our alumni. They have mastered the skills of communicating their work to broad audiences. And in fact, many of them, again, have been a winner. So please help me give a warm welcome to Sede Tekari. She's a professor at the Freeman School of Business. She's the People's Choice Award winner for UB's first annual three-minute thesis competition back in 2017. Thank you for joining us today. Our next judge is Philip Adonkor. He's an assistant professor at Stevens Institute of Technology. He was the first place winner at UB's second annual three-minute thesis competition in 2018. Our third judge, Konstantinos Plakas. He's a scientist in New Jersey Biopharmaceuticals, a small biotech company. He was the second place winner at UB's third annual three-minute thesis competition back in 2019. And our last judge, Neila Sahar. She's an assistant professor at Foreman Christian College, and she was the second place winner at UB's second annual three-minute thesis competition back in 2018. Again, I'd like to remind you that your votes will determine the People's Choice Award winner. So please have a device ready so that you may cast a vote when the time comes. And now on to the competition. Our finalists today represent the absolute finest at UB. They have, there have been several rounds of judging and today we have the 12 finalists. I'm going to be introducing each of the finalists to you and as I'm doing so, they will join the competition on the stage and get ready to present. I will finish my introduction always with the words ready, set, pitch. The finalists will then take a moment to center themselves. And when they start speaking their first word, their slide will appear on the screen and the three minute timer will begin. Starting us off today is Giovanni, excuse me, it is Deviani Giovanni with her presentation titled Rethinking Needle in a Haystack, Approaching Materials Discovery. She comes from the Materials Design and Innovation Department in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And she, um, she grew up in Vadodara, India and likes to read and hike. In fact, she likes to hike so much that she was the Vice President of the University Hiking Club during her undergraduate. Thank you very much for joining us. And please go ahead when you're ready. Ready? Set pitch. If you had to, how would you look for a needle in a haystack? You would probably sift through the pile stand by stand until you found the needle. But what if you had no idea what a needle looked like, but you knew that it was heavier than hay? You might dump the hay in a pool of water and hope for the needle to sink. But what if you knew that the needle was fire retardant and magnetic? Then you could burn the haystack and use a magnet to pull it directly from the ashes into your hands. Once you know certain properties of the needle, the ones that set it apart from hay, there are multiple options to retrieve it. The task of discovering materials is comparable to finding a needle. New materials are discovered by trial and error approach, which is analogous to sifting through the hay. And this creates a premise for suboptimal materials being selected, which means that we may confuse a stiff pointy hay stand for the needle. In my research, we zoom into the material to identify the distinguishing and useful features. But why should we care about materials discovery? Materials are ubiquitous. Metals, plastics, even food is made up of materials. 
but did you know that some really common materials were discovered accidentally rubber super glue concrete were all accidents one such accident was made by scientists who were trying to treat heart conditions thereby little blue pill was invented and ironically its side effect is heart attack my work is to reduce this uncertainty while accelerating the discovery process to address the calls for newer materials that that are designed just for our needs we cannot depend on traditional discoveries when new materials are synthesized before being tested for desirable properties this is tedious and incredibly expensive computers are superior at solving complex problems optimizing our needs while taking only seconds to make these decisions my work is to develop algorithms to predict properties of compounds that do not even exist and reduce physical experimentation significantly i have applied this work to organic solar cells where the aim is to identify the key features that directly impact the cell performance i have further extended this work to plant based meats by infusing proteins in mushroom roots we can make it just as healthy as meat and address the 13 billion tons of waste or 18% of greenhouse gases that is produced by livestock every year now you may wonder what these two seemingly different materials may have in common but the properties depend on the structure of materials and my work is to enable the extraction of these features or the needle in the haystack and since we get to design materials based on properties we could eventually create something as cool as harry potter's invisibility cloak the possibilities are endless thank you thank you very much deviani for that presentation i find it quite fascinating that in fact you can design things with a computer using algorithms before actually having the material itself and i appreciate the work that you're doing it sounds very fascinating thank you our second presenter today will be Asalia Murancha. Her title of the presentation is HIV Paradox, using documentary films to reduce HIV stigma in Indonesia. She comes to us from the Department of Media Study in the College of Arts and Sciences and is a native of Jakarta, Indonesia. She wants to be an academic and filmmaker. And in fact, her dissertation will be her 20th film that she makes during her study at UB. Thank you for joining us, Asalia. And when you're ready, set. Pitch. Good afternoon. Since 2013, I have been working with people living with HIV in Indonesia as an activist filmmaker. Before then, I had thought people living with HIV were skinny, sick, and having a death sentence. Because this is the image of HIV that we often see in the media. But look at my slide here. This is Rika. She is young, beautiful, and has a healthy lifestyle. When I first met her, I would have never thought that Rika had HIV. Her ex-husband used drugs behind her back and exchanged needles with other people. As a result, she became HIV positive. There are 640,000 other people like Rika who live with HIV in Indonesia. This is not a small number, considering that Indonesia is the world's largest archipelago and the fourth most populated country on Earth. It is also home to the largest Muslim population, which means that HIV advocacy is a delicate subject matter as it is usually stigmatized as an immoral disease. This stigma is spread and amplified in the media. So in my research as a media scholar, I am looking into the way that HIV is portrayed and talked about in the media. My findings show that from the beginning of its discovery in Indonesia in the 1980s to today, HIV narratives in the media produce and reproduce othering towards people living with HIV. People are reluctant to get tested or to access the free HIV medication out of fear of being ousted from their families, schools, workplaces, and communities. The solution to this problem is to create counter narratives. And Indonesia is such a perfect place to do this because we have a history of changing the narratives in the media through propaganda. But instead of the top-down government commission propaganda film, my model of advocacy media comes from the bottom up. In my dissertation film, I am using documentary to talk about HIV differently. 
I show how people who live with HIV can have a normal life like Rika, who is now remarried and has an HIV negative child. My film centers on people like Rika to tell their personal stories to the general audience. And by hearing Rika's story, the audience can relate to her as a human being, despite her HIV status. With this intervention, I hope I can change HIV narratives in the media and in the long run, reduce the stigma so people will get tested and access the free medications in Indonesia. This research is one important piece of the puzzle that can impact the way that information is delivered in the media to solve public health issues, not just in Indonesia, but also globally. Thank you. Thank you, Asalia. I am really fascinated by the work that you're doing. I find that it's a, a great idea to do it in a scalable manner, and, and I wish you much luck. It is a huge Thank problem. You. Thank you. Our third presenter today is Saber Memordust. He comes to us from the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He will be telling us about building our own brain connectome. And on his free time, Saber likes to play soccer very much like I do. We'll have to see each other in the field one day. Sure. He to watch movies and has a very long bucket list because he wants to visit locations where all his favorite movies have been filmed. Thank you for joining us today, Saber. And ready, set, pitch. What if I told you this presentation is going to change your brain forever? How do you learn? Why some people learn faster than others? When I was a kid, I was so passionate about soccer. I wanted to learn soccer and play better than my older brother, but it never happened. I grew up with this question in my mind. How could I properly learn soccer? Over time, I came to know that the brain is responsible for learning any skill. Brain is the least understood organ, and it's more sophisticated than any supercomputer on Earth. Your brain contains over 100 billion cells. To put this huge number in the context, this is equal to the total number of hairs on the heads of people in Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, and Yonkers all combined. Unlike many of us, brain cells are very good at communication and teamwork. In fact, they never act alone. Rather, the connections between them are where the information and memories are stored. Your memories, the information that makes you, you, and perhaps other aspects of your personal identity, such as your personality and your intellect, are all encoded in the connections between your brain cells. Every time you experience something new, learn a new fact or a new skill, your brain rewires. This is a mysterious mechanism that enables us to learn new skills, to memorize new information, or to forget old ones. To figure out how our brain learns, we need to understand the fundamentals of brain rewiring. But first, we need to find the connections. But how? Imagine you're in a, in a packed Bills stadium on a match day. Cheers from the fans are echoing all around. I ask you to record the crowd noise for a few minutes. Now, can you tell me who is talking to whom in the crowd? This is exactly what I do in my research. I develop computational algorithms to find connections between brain cells or the fans from brain activity or the crowd noise. Our studies on mice have given novel insights about the relationship between brain rewiring and learning. My research can shed light on the principles of memory formation and learning. One day, we may be able to build an artificial brain, a super powerful computer just like our brain. In my research, I often find myself seeking answers to the basic questions I had about learning since my childhood. But as a grown up, I have learned a bigger lesson from my work. Remember, you and your ever-changing brain are constantly being shaped by the world around you. So make sure to only let the positivities of the world rewire your brain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saber, for that presentation. And I think that was a very effective use of the, of the analogy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our fourth presenter today is Sarah Metcalf. She comes to us from Elmira, just a, a few hours away. She will be telling us about when good turns bad in the oral cavity. And she's a student in the Department of Oral Biology 
in the School of Dental Medicine. In her free time, and particularly nowadays, she enjoys taking pictures and has been doing such of birds, I guess, in Buffalo since the pandemic, very actively. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us today. And when you are ready, set, pitch. Did you know that nearly half the people here could have some form of gum disease? In fact, severe gum disease is the sixth most prevalent disease worldwide. It accounts for a major portion of the over $400 billion in yearly cost for oral diseases. If you've ever had bloody gums when brushing your teeth, that's actually a sign of early gum disease. And I'm sure your dentist has reminded you that regular brushing and flossing, along with professional cleanings, is usually enough to prevent the progression of gum disease, along with the tooth loss and other linked diseases, like heart disease, associated with it. However, there are many factors that conspire to enhance disease, including genetics, environment, and microbes. This conspiracy of events leads to inflam inflammatory conditions such as bloody and swollen gums, along with loose and sensitive teeth. You probably know that we are riddled with microbes, like bacteria, most of which are harmless and in fact are important for maintaining our health. What you may not know is that these microbes are not always such good guys. Some are double agents. The same microbe that plays a beneficial role in one circumstance can be quite harmful in another. My research has found that a normally healthy oral bacterium can promote the inflammatory conditions seen in gum disease, acting as fuel for the fire. The immune system in the mouth is one of those important factors that acts like a propellant in gum disease. In fact, the disease in part results from an overreaction in the immune system, leading to recession of the gums and destruction of the bones around the teeth, and even eventual tooth loss. My research is determining some of the mechanisms involved in the progression of disease development. Under, the, under healthy conditions, there's a beneficial balance between microbes and immune cells that work to maintain a strong and mature immune environment. However, in disease, the conditions can turn, more like an uncontrolled wildfire, where overgrowth of bacteria and introduction of bad bacteria can cause the painful inflammation we see when brushing and flossing. This inflammation, counterintuitively, can promote the survival of the normally healthy bacteria, which can in turn promote more inflammation, leading to a fiery ring of inflammation, destruction, and disease progression. However, this detrimental feedback loop can be intervened with the work of dentists and improved treatment options. I know everyone wants to avoid painful dentist visits and high bills. While brushing and flossing is important, so is a better understanding of how disease can develop and better ways to intervene, saving money and smiles for millions of people. My research as an oral biologist is an important piece in the puzzle for fighting tooth loss and developing better therapeutics to give dentists better tools to fight the fire. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. I think I may be using some of your tips with my kids. See <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you. Our fifth presenter today, <clears throat> excuse me, is Ronak Mehrabi. Ronak is going to be telling us about her work in biomediated soil enhancement. She comes to us from the Department of Civil Structural and Environmental Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. She's a strong advocate of climate change and cares deeply about our planet. And she is a foodie that cannot live without cheese. Ronak, when you're ready, set, pitch. I'm a civil engineer and my job is to ensure your safety by designing a stable structures. As you know, the stability of all type of structures start from the soil beneath them. This soil could be naturally dense and steep, such as sea cliffs or the walls of canyons and valleys. But this soil could be naturally loose and wet. Imagine a pool packed with ping pong balls and water. This example best represents the composition of a loose, wet soil. Now, think what happens if you tap your foot into, a, into this pool packed with balls and water. Yes, your foot will definitely sink into it. This experience is similar to what happens to a structure during liquefaction, a geological hazard that is responsible for large infrastructural damages during earthquakes. In liquefaction, the loose wet soil acts like a fluid rather than a solid due to earthquake shakes. As a result, the structures collapse and sink into the soil. Current, uh, the current way to mitigate liquefaction is mixing the soil with chemical cement to make it as strong as concrete. However, the chemical cement is costly and the manufacturing of it is responsible for emission of up to 5% of greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases around the world. 
but we always can come up with an innovative and uh, better design and solution to prevent the natural hazards by taking the inspiration from the smartest engineer around us, the nature. In this regard, my research investigates the use of a natural sustainable cement called calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is a mineral that is naturally created on earth or in fresh water by means of microorganisms and through some chemical reactions. Um, this process can be synthesized in our laboratory by mixing the soil with a specific bacteria and a specific chemicals and letting the chemical reactions happen over a few days. The product is calcium carbonate, which is our natural cement. Now, remember the example of the ping pong balls as the grains of our soil. When the natural cement is produced between these grains by help of the bacteria, this uh, cement attaches the grains or say balls together as a glue. This glue-like connection prevents the balls or grains, uh, prevents the movement and the sliding of these balls or grains relative to each other. As a result, we have a solid concrete-like soil that we stand earthquake shakes and is reliable to build our infrastructures on. Now, you can see where I found the biggest motivation to carry out this research, inspiration by nature and sustainability. My goal is to promote and advance the use of processes found in nature to solve engineering problems related to earth structures. After all, I'm a civil engineer and I should put your safety first. Why, why not to do it with the help of our mother nature? Thank you. Thank you, Ronak. That is really cool how you're harnessing nature to, to develop a, a better solution. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Our next presenter <clears throat> is Kasi MD Muhabuber Raman. Thank you very much for joining us today. He comes from the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences in the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. He's a native of Dhaka in Bangladesh, and he, he would like one day to take a road trip in the Pan American Highway and likes to invent quick cooking techniques. Maybe he'll have some tips for us. When you're ready, set, pitch. Just in the USA, on an average, every 60 minutes, there are two bladder cancer patients dead and 10 newly diagnosed. Bladder cancer is one of the costliest cancer to manage mostly because of its recurrences. In fact, a full course treatment of the most recently approved medicine can cost a patient about $300,000. Unfortunately, there are no treatments which do not cause severe side effects on the healthy part of the bladder or can fully prevent the cancer from coming back. The goal of my research is to treat bladder cancer without harming or losing the healthy part of the bladder. For that, we need to find and kill the cancer specifically. Consider the bladder as an ancient village which is invaded by aliens, cancer cells. These aliens look almost like humans and it is very hard to distinguish them. Scientists came up with an idea of putting a chemical, let's say chemical A in every houses of the village. Unlike normal villagers, aliens made a lot of chemical B using chemical A. That's exactly what was needed. As this chemical B is photoactive, scientists lit up the whole village using laser and caused the houses which have chemical B in them to glow. Finding the aliens or cancer cells is not enough. And this technique was not efficient enough to kill them either. That's where my research comes in. We have developed inactive chemotherapy drugs that will require light and chemical B to get activated. So once chemical A and our inactive drugs will be given in the bladder, aliens will be making more chemical B and with laser, we can activate our inactive drugs mostly in the aliens houses. And this will help us to kill the aliens both by laser and chemotherapy. As normal cells will not be making enough chemical B, our drugs will not be active in the healthy tissue and ultimately we can save the bladder. We have already developed several inactive drugs like this and found promising preliminary results in the experiments on cancer cells. And currently we are evaluating our drugs in animal models to treat experimentally induced bladder cancer. These techniques can also help 
uh, can also help to activate the body's immune system to fight against cancer coming back. That may help the recurrence problem of bladder cancer. We are very excited to complete this research here at UB and take it to the next level where we can treat other cancers like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, et cetera, where we can use a similar strategy of activating inactive chemotherapy drugs, mostly in the tumor, so that we don't have to lose our hair, nail, or beautiful skin while still killing the cancer using chemotherapy to live a healthy life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cassie, for, for your work. Family members have been affected by this personally, so, so I appreciate very much the effort that you're putting into this. Thank you. Right now, I'd like to, to take a very brief um, break and reintroduce again Gra Graham very quickly so that he may make a few comments. Thanks, Alan. Um, and we're at, the, at this point, we're switching the slide deck, so I'm just gonna thank a couple of people um, involved in the three-minute thesis competition. Um, I, I'd like to thank the staff from the Graduate School and Blackstone Launchpad um, and Techstars who have really worked to support this event, to make it happen, and to work with all the students who, whose um, research we've been learning about. So specifically, I want to issue thanks to Hadar Borden, to Alec, um, Alex Pelk, to Andrea Kraft, to Ron Bada, and to Liam Christie from Blackstone Launchpad. And from to the graduate school, I'd like to thank Sandy Flash, Sue Adenolfi, Brittany um, Iannucci, and Ashley Cannons Alasco for coordinating the event for UB. And also, I definitely want to thank Delia Cozzarelli and the English Language Institute for supporting this event. Alan, thanks to you, um, and also to, um, to Business Development Industry Engagement um, and to UB's business and entrepreneurial partners um, for sponsoring the event and also for um, for um, funding the prizes that are gonna be awarded at the end of this event. So thank you very much. Perfect, thank you very much, Graham, for that. And now I'd like to introduce our seventh presenter. Amanda Asecha is coming to us from Binghamton, also just a few hours away from where we stand, most of us anyways. She is in the learning and instruction department within the Graduate School of Education. On her free time, she likes to write, read, and teach, which makes sense based on her topic today. She's going to tell us about shifting gears in education to limit the research practice gap. When you're ready, set, pitch. How does a bicycle ride smoothly over a variety of uphill and downhill terrains? The gears, working in conjunction to adjust for the complexities of the environment. The gears of our education system, educational researchers, teachers, and school districts must work in the same way to be effective, but they're often divided. Researchers often conduct inapplicable, inaccessible studies. Teachers often inadvertently use methods that are not empirically supported, and school districts are often disconnected from student needs. Though these three groups want to improve the educational experience for students, the gap between these gears can create a bumpy ride. There have been efforts to bring the gears together, like the formation of research practice partnerships. These partnerships are long-term collaborations between researchers, teachers, and districts designed to find problems in practice and together investigate ways to improve schools. What remains unclear is the extent that these partnerships can bring the gears together. The goal of my work as an educational researcher is to see how a research practice partnership here at UB can bring together local researchers, teachers, and the Buffalo Public School District. The UB Teacher Residency Program is a research practice partnership that prepares pre-service teachers to teach specifically in the urban Buffalo community. Pre-service teachers co-teach alongside a Buffalo public school teacher for a full year while supervised by district leaders and UB researchers and while taking classes. For one year, I interviewed, surveyed, and observed residency stakeholders to see how collaboration between a research-invested university and an urban school district can bring these gears together. So far, I found that there are gaps and assumptions in, and perspectives between these groups, but I also found that this type of partnership does help UB researchers understand the needs of the district, and researchers and practitioners engage in frequent productive interactions. 
UB researchers started basing their work off of the needs of the district. And district leaders and teachers worked with researchers to more regularly implement evidence-based strategies into their classrooms. Overall, symbiotic relationships and a sense of community formed between these three groups. So my work shows that when educators collaboratively train pre-service teachers through a teacher residency research practice partnership, the gears of education can work in unison. In the future, we can use this residency model as a structure to help other institutions oil the gears in their communities and bring together their local researchers, teachers, and districts. And we can see how this type of partnership can impact student learning in the long run. Thank you. Amanda, thank you very much. As someone that has two kids in the school system, I can, and particularly this year, I really appreciate everything that they're doing. So thank you for helping them be effective. It's really wonderful. Our next presenter today is Benush Satari Babukani. The title of her presentation is Slippery Flatlands. She comes to us from the Department of Materials Design and Innovation in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, a native of Isfahan, Iran. And she is, since she was eight years old, apparently she decided it was time to leave home and start living in a cave for the rest of her life. And I guess the police got involved and we'll leave it at that for today. Whenever you're ready, set, pitch. Have you ever thought about the role of your car engine oil? How does it protect your car from breaking down in the middle, middle of the road? Your car engine efficiency suffers from the friction that occurs at various rubbing mechanical components, such as the piston and the cylinder. These friction losses increase the fuel consumption and therefore have a direct impact on greenhouse gas emission and climate change. The only solution for mitigating friction is developing efficient lubricants. In the same way we use oil drops to reduce the squeaking of a door, they can be used at the rubbing parts of an engine. However, to improve the performance of the oil, a small percentage of friction reducing agents is required. These tiny robots, which we call them as a blue additive. In my PhD research, I use graphene as a friction reducing agent. Graphene is only one atom thick layer of graphite, graphite the lead of your pencil. It consists of carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb structure. Graphene is the strongest material in the world. It is also flexible and inert, and all these properties make this amazing material a potential candidate to be used as a loop additive. However, Graphene tends to absorb all oil molecules in an ordered arrangement, layer by layer, on top of each other. In such an organized fashion, the density of oil molecules in the vicinity of graphene increases dramatically. This dense coherent structure behaves like a solid rather than a liquid. Now tell me which one would you prefer, using your surfboard on water or on a road? Sliding on graphene with an ordered structure of oil molecules will feel like surfing on a road. These ordered structures make graphene stiffer, leading to higher friction. My goal is to understand the impact of the chemistry of oil molecules on generating these ordered structures on top of graphene. And through careful selection of oil structure, successfully we could reduce friction up to 90%. This means that using our new lubricant, next time you don't need to hesitate for a few cents differences in the price of the fuel at different gas stations, because you only need 10 gallons of fuel instead of 15 gallons and still traverse the same distance with your Toyota Camry. Therefore, these next generation additives will not only conserve our environment, but we'll also save our pockets by consuming less fuel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benush. That was a wonderful presentation. I have myself killed a car once for not putting any oil in it. So I learned that lesson earlier in life, unfortunately. Thank you for the work that you do. Our next presenter is Yuhao Shi. He comes to us from the Department of Experimental Therapeutics at Roswell Park, which is where I graduated from my PhD. His hometown is in Albany, New York, and he immigrated here from China when he was eight years old. 
You may find Yuha running around listening to podcasts or audiobooks, and he's a big fan of this American Life with Ira Glass on NPR. Thank you for joining us today, Yuha. And when you're ready, set, pitch. Your body's immune system helps protect you from cancer. But sometimes cancer has ways to evade or hide from this response. This is where immunotherapy comes in. These agents help uncover cancer in hiding, allow for immune cells to find an attack. There are really three main outcomes for patients on immunotherapy. The first and best case scenario, the use of these drugs has led to remarkable recoveries for patients whose cancers have spread throughout their bodies. The second case scenario is that we find out immediately that these drugs do not work at all. We wanted to study the third scenario. That is when therapy initially works, but after months and sometimes years, cancer grows back. To do this, we gave immunotherapy to mice with different tumors and found a type of mouse tumor that can mimic this outcome of initial benefit and then eventual therapy failure. This was surprisingly difficult because unlike other widely used cancer drugs, treatment with immunotherapy in most mouse tumors did not reflect this phenomenon. We then examined tumor cells before and after therapy failed and found that when immunotherapy stopped working, tumor cells started to release a slew of secreted molecules that act as a unique shield protecting against immune cell attack. Using data from human cancers after treatment failure, we saw similar changes in secretions, suggesting that this process can also occur for patients. Interestingly, we found that a majority of these molecules were controlled by a key protein called interferons or IFNs. So when we stopped interferons in tumor cells or took away secretions one by one, piercing this shield, we drastically slowed the growth of tumors after therapy failure. Currently, thousands of patients are being treated with immunotherapy worldwide. For many, when therapy fails, there's no great alternatives. Targeting interference may be the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, you have for your, for your work in this very important problem. I think we obviously can appreciate what you're working on. Thank you very much. Our next presenter today is Olivia Licara. She comes to us from the Department of Materials Design and Innovation in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. I am told that she grew up in a house that has its own wiki page. We'll have to learn more about that at some other time. And her claim to fame is that she is proficient in movie quotes and can in fact give better recommendations than Alexa. Thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to learning more about design from the Atom app. And when you're ready, set, pitch. Did you know that your cell phone has 100,000 times more processing power than the computer that helped us land on the moon? Now, what's really shocking about that statement is that your cell phone fits in your hand. How could we go from a room full of computers to something that fits in our pocket? Because tiny is powerful. And over the last 50 years, we've utilized the power of working at the atomic scale. Interactions at the atomic level influence life-size performance in our cell phones, computers, cars, even energy conversion in wind turbines. Now, in order to design these components, we need to be able to see at the atomic level. That's where my work comes in. In our lab, we can see atoms and know their identity and 3D location. Now, just to give you a picture of just how small an atom is, think of one strand of your hair. The width of your hair is approximately one million atoms. In our lab, we focus on the semiconductors materials. Semiconductors are necessary in everyday devices like your phone and computer. The internet itself relies on semiconductors. Semiconductor materials are necessary because their conductivity changes based on an input, such as temperature, which is how your rice cooker always cooks at the perfect temperature. You may have heard of semiconductors before in the form of a circuit or a chip. Our aim is to improve the fabrication process of these chips so that they can achieve maximum efficiency and performance. These rely on interactions at the atomic level. We provide the story behind each device component, how the layers stacked up, whether the materials were evenly distributed or segregated to different zones. 
from this story, we can achieve maximum efficiency and performance. Uh, <laughs> so um, <laughs> how this tool works is it removes one atom at a time. However, one of the major focuses of mine is the unique occurrence where multiple atoms are removed at the same time and detected. These are more complicated events and so they're often overlooked. But to me, they can provide unique insight on the quality of the bond between layers, which don't always stack up so well. Imagine trying to stack Legos on top of Lincoln logs. <laughs> that type of mismatch you would see, but an atomic level mismatch requires an atomic level tool, the atom probe. Our innovation is allowing for optimization of technology in your daily lives beyond just your cell phone or computer. We are making are your devices work faster and last longer through a more efficient conversion of energy. Tiny is powerful and can create a more sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivia. It's hard to imagine that we can do things at the atomic level like that. So thank you very much for teaching us about it and, and your work. Our next presenter is Jennifer Monjovi. Her title today is How Treating Metabolic Syndrome Could Improve Ovarian Cancer Survival. She comes from the Department of Epidemiology and Environmental Health at the School of Public Health and Health Professions. She's a native of Boston Spa, I'm sorry, Boston Lake, I'm sorry. And her guilty pleasure is to actually watch some good police crime drama shows. We share that in common. Thank you very much for joining us today, Jennifer. And when you are ready, set, pitch. If you've ever had a family member who was diagnosed with cancer, then sadly, you're among the 50% of Americans who've gone through this upsetting experience. Despite advancements in screenings and treatments, survival rates for some cancers hasn't changed much, and most people are doubtful will be a cure in their lifetime. This is true for ovarian cancer, sometimes called the silent killer. There are currently no screening recommendations for this cancer, and the standard treatment has remained essentially the same since the 1980s, over 40 years ago. While the average woman only has about a 1% lifetime risk, that's still over 20,000 women each year in the United States alone who are told that they have a greater chance of flipping tails on a coin than surviving five years. Survival is much higher when catching this cancer at an earlier stage, but symptoms aren't typically experienced until later stages and are nonspecific, like weight loss or feeling bloated. Factors that predict survival are characteristics of the tumor itself, like the cell type or the size of the tumor, which can't be modified. Therefore, the goal of my research has been to identify modifiable factors that could be intervened on to prolong survival. One such approach is targeting metabolic syndrome, which is defined as having three or more of the medical conditions highlighted on this slide. Medical or the metabolic, metabolic syndrome conditions have the potential to activate pro-cancer signaling pathways while shutting off anti-cancer signals. So far, what we do know about this is that metabolic syndrome has been found to have a negative effect on treatment outcomes in several other cancers. What we don't know, and what I'd like to find out, is if there are specific conditions or combinations, like having both hypertension and diabetes, that may be more or less favorable for ovarian cancer. To answer this question, my dissertation is focused on statistical analyses to identify combinations of risk factors associated with survival, specifically, looking at metabolic syndrome conditions and related medications among women with ovarian cancer. Because we know that these conditions can be modified through diet, exercise, and medication use, it is possible that these same strategies could be applied to improve ovarian cancer survival. This is of increasing importance since not only has survival for this cancer seen minimal improvement, but now over half of adult females in the US meet the criteria for metabolic syndrome. Also, Female cancer patients are a particularly motivated group and often more receptive to lifestyle interventions. Simple lifestyle changes for healthier living or the repurposing of existing medications may have the potential to provide safe and non-invasive strategies to complement existing treatments, like those from the 1980s. My hope is that through these analyses, I'll be able to identify specific groups of women who may benefit most from these complementary strategies and be able to live longer, healthier lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. This is a, a huge problem, obviously, given that we do not have optimal ways of diagnosing ovarian cancer. Thank you very much for, for your work. 
And our, our last presenter today is Shreya Mukherjee. She, her title today is going to be Drive Towards Cleaner v Vehicles. She comes to us from the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. She's a native of Howrah, India. I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah, that's good. Very interested in public speaking, drawing, and singing, and has a, a wish to visit every library in the world. Hope you get going soon. When you are ready, yes. that pitch. Uh, thank you, Alan. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm actually, I like to work on uh, different, solving different energy technologies. Uh, as my title says, today I'll talk about drive towards cleaner vehicles. Uh, I don't know how many of you are uh, excited to own or rent your own clean vehicle one day, but I just want to convey one message today that zero emission cars use a fuel that not only burn without emitting any carbon dioxide, but the fuel when produced should not emit any carbon dioxide. So, you know, the electric cars, which are already very popular, should will be clean, 100% clean, only if they are not uh, they are always using 100% renewable electricity to recharge them, which is one of the problems because currently only 20% of the electricity demand is met by renewable electricity for any purpose. The other alternative uh, technology which is there is hydrogen, which is a little less popular because hydrogen is very difficult to store and transport. You know, there are hydrogen refueling stations only in California in US, and that's because refueling stations are very expensive. So to bring in renewable hydrogen from different states or different countries makes it even more expensive. And there are like uh, several uh, scientists who are working on making the uh, hydrogen transportation easier. But what we are trying to do is now use a liquid fuel like ammonia, which can be brought in on site and can be uh, broken on site into hydrogen on demand. But the problem there is the currently the material that is used, like the catalyst that is used to increase the conversion from ammonia into hydrogen is based on a very precious metal like ruthenium. And what we are trying to do is to use alternative or substitute materials which will uh, make the cost, which, may, which will make it cost effective and which will be able to make it uh, commercialized. So we have been able to uh, do that as of now wherein the cost reduction has become 50%. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, so uh, it, will, it will actually help in uh, reducing the uh, hydrogen transportation problem and uh, make the hydrogen technology uh, at least uh, uh, feasible. So uh, there are some companies which uh, like air products which are going into uh, the, making this technology commercial and if you're questioning what if the chemicals that we are using uh, are actually uh, synthesized uh, without generating carbon dioxide then yes there are researchers who are actually trying to generate ammonia uh, without generating carbon dioxide and we are also working on that so this should be an alternative technology which will not eliminate the battery vehicles which will not eliminate electric vehicles but will also uh, be a substitute in making renewable en uh, energy more accessible to a wider uh, world for a cleaner uh, drive towards cleaner vehicles yeah thank you for your attention Thank you so much, Shreya. This is uh, clearly a chicken or the egg type problem and you're working on, on a number of ways to, to address it. So thank you very much for that. And that concludes our, our presentations for today. I'd like to give all of the participants a, a virtual round of applause. Suppose we could do at least a, that while on this forum. Thank you all very much for, for presenting um, in such succinct way. It is not easy um, as we have been learning for, for many years. We again think that this is a, a wonderful competition and thank you for, for working so hard on your presentations and your slides. I know I learned many things today and I hope that the audience did as well. So thank you all. Right now, I'd like for, for the audience to start getting ready, get your devices ready. The judges are going to be deliberating over the, the next few minutes. But again, today you are a judge as well. There's going to be a link posted in the chat in the next few minutes. And there will also be a QR code on the screen. You can use your phone to take a, to aim your camera to the QR code as a way to enable the voting, or you could access the link on your computer or other device. Please do so. You're going to have about three minutes to do the voting in the spirit in the spirit of this competition. So please go ahead, access that link. It has just been posted to 
the chat room and cast away your votes. Here's one more minute open for voting for the People's Choice Award. And you have the QR code on the screen. You have the link available in the chat. All right, so that concludes our time for voting for the People's Choice Award. Thank you all of you that have participated. I hope that you enjoyed the presentations. Um, it's now time to play um, a short video to hopefully uh, share with you how excited we are about innovation at the University of Buffalo. After that video, I'd like to share just a quick four slides or so about what it is that business and entrepreneur partnerships uh, does, how they may be able to support your your innovations here at the university while you are a student or thereafter and that way we will also allow the the judges to have a little bit extra time to do their voting i certainly would not want to be in their shoes today i think this is a, a really tough call so thank you all and i hope that you enjoy the next few minute video
is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great. I hope that you find that video as inspirational as I do. I think that it summarizes that, you know, as long as you follow your passion, you will be successful. You will enjoy every day, which is very, very important to what you do. You're going to be working for a long time. And it is really key to find something that you are absolutely passionate about. I think that's what we are here to do uh, at the university at Buffalo, particularly at business entrepreneur partnerships. I'd like to share with you just uh, a very few slides on what it is that we do and how it is that we may be able to help some of you. We are here to, to help you build partnerships with other companies in the area or beyond our reach here in Western New York. We, we really work pretty hard at connecting our faculty and students with industry to try to identify things that they can work on together and really benefit from that symbiotic relationship of the students and the faculty members exchanging their knowledge for an opportunity to use um, what it is that they have been learning on in a, in a real world uh, example. We certainly support the commercialization of your ideas. We are here to advise you in, in how to best enter into what type of partnership, how to develop things. And we have a keen interest in growing um, the New York State economy. It is certainly very important to all of us to do so through, through innovation. And this is something that I think has been highlighted many times today in our, in our 12 presentations. So thank you again, all of the participants for doing that. We have a number of ways to do that and to support you. There are, there are a number of centers and economic development initiatives here, whether you may be CAT, for example, this provides the opportunity to get research funding for your products in projects in life sciences and big data. The Buffalo Institute for Genomics and Data Analytics, which is an economic development fund helping companies in Erie County specifically to grow here with us. Many of them are hiring all, a lot of our UB graduates. So this is a wonderful partnership that we can really leverage through the UB CAT or big we also have a Center of Excellence in Materials Informatics, or the CMI. In here, we provide some funding to faculty that is collaborating with industry partners to address really key problems in research and in the research space in, again, materials and informatics. The Center of Excellence in Bioinformatics and Life Sciences has a number of core facilities. Some of you perhaps has interacted with the genomics core, the proteomics core, perhaps the biorepository. We're opening also a wonderful new incubator downtown Buffalo at 701 Ellicott on the second floor. It is literally going to be opening in the next two, three weeks, and it's going to look awesome. It's going to be a place where, where UB faculty, students, and, and our really extended family can interact with industry partners with the purpose of really benefiting from each other's experience and, and knowledge. Our technology transfer and other business development services associated with commercialization of UB uh, technologies are there to support you when a company may be reaching out to you and try to figure out how to work with them, please rely on the, on the advice and support. They are there to help you. As I mentioned before, we have that incubator in, in the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, but there is another one just on North Campus uh, at the Bird Research Park. Also, we call it the technology incubator where you have co-working space, you have some office space, and you have some research space where some of our UB spin-offs have found a home for the past few years. We have the Western New York Incubator Network where you can access um, the learnings of some of the, our incubator partners in the, in the Western New York Incubator Network. Um, we are also able to provide you with some access to, to ad hoc expertise for perhaps covering the expense of talking to a regulatory consultant. And we have the Startup New York program that provides a, a company that starts up in, in New York State in some of the, um, for example, in our campus plan to actually avoid paying taxes for the next 10 years. This is something that their employees can also benefit. So that is a, a nice incentive 
to, to enable some of the companies here in our area to hire UB graduates and to enable them to not actually pay an extra almost 10%. So that is a very nice incentive the last 10 years that we also manage through our university. How we do this? As I mentioned before, we do this by providing access to new technologies and solutions. There is incredible knowledge and expertise at the university and we help our companies in our space to access that. We have some ability to fund some research and development projects across disciplines. Obviously we have a great deal of university expertise. Many of you students are you know, absolutely skilled, are about to finish your degrees and are going to be looking to enter the, the workforce. So we offer a bridge to do that. We provide opportunities for those that are already in our region and are looking to just seek additional education to participate in some specific programming, provide some business services training and access obviously to high tech equipment that would be just unaffordable to buy as a, as a very early stage startup. We do have again, incubator and co-working spaces. Many times this is how some of the UB uh, companies um, have started. It is really economical and a wonderful place to, to start maturing an idea. With that, I'd like to leave you we, with some numbers and we are very proud of what we have been achieving over the past few years, but we are not done. We need to do a lot more. We have supported a number of startups. We have engaged with several hundred students. A lot of jobs have been created in the area, supported in part by, by our unit, Business and Entrepreneur Partnerships. And we are working with a large number of, of industry partners that again, could provide that working opportunity for, for some of you. A lot of our students, 16,000, close to 17,000, have been engaged in some of our entrepreneurial programs. There are many to mention. And of course, if you have any interest in learning more about anything that I have said, uh, please feel free to send us an email. As you can see, my, I have been affected by coronavirus, at least in my looks as of the past year, but we are very serious, very professional, and we really have a lot of relationships here in the, in the region that we'd like to, to leverage and to you know, share them with you for your benefit, the region's benefit to make a win-win partnership. Thank you very much for, for listening. At this point, we're going to be taking a, a small break um, to provide the judges with additional time to, to come up with their deliberations. And we will be back in just a few short minutes. Thank you all very much. I am told that we have our winners. And at this time, I would like to welcome Graham Hamill, 
Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Graduate School, back to, to the stage, to this virtual stage, to begin the award presentations. Graham? Thanks, Alan. I, um, this is the moment that everyone's been waiting for. I'm going to announce the award winners in just a second. I, I definitely want, Alan, again, to thank you for emceeing this event. Um, and, um, and I really get, um, offer a special thanks to all the graduate students who have participated. So I'm about to, um, about to announce the awards. And just so everybody is aware, the first place prize is $1,000. The second place prize is $750. And the third place prize is $500. As everyone here knows, there's also a People's Choice Award, which is $250. And I want to thank our sponsor, Innovation Hub, powered by UB's Business and Entrepreneur Partnerships. I want to thank them again for their support, which makes the cash prizes possible. So this is the moment you're waiting for. Um, third place. Prize. I have to look at my notes, so pardon me for just a second. Um, third place prize goes to Building Your Brain Connect to Me, Saber Mimardost. So congratulations to Saber. Second place prize goes to Shifting Gears in Education to Limit the Research Practice Gap, Amanda Sicha. First place prize goes to HIV Paradox using documentary films to reduce HIV stigma in Indonesia, Azalea Muran Shah. Congratulations, Azalea. And finally, People's Choice Award goes to Piercing Cancer's Protective Shield, Yu Hao Shi. So I just wanna conclude the ceremonies again by um, congratulating our award winners, by thanking the judges for coming back to UB and, um, and evaluating these excellent presentations and by really thanking everyone who presented. All of the presentations were absolutely terrific and I look forward to next year's event when hopefully we'll be back on the stage um, and doing this in person. So thank you and I hope everyone has a good afternoon.